get started here. Jan, did you want to say a few words to kick things off? Yeah, thank you. Um, good morning and welcome to our webinar today, Priorities, Challenges, and Opportunities for Climate Smart Agriculture in Washington. Uh, my name is Jan Thomas and I am the Training Program Manager for the Center for Technical Development or CTD. Um, and I'm just really pleased to be here to help support today's webinar with our presenters. Just wanted to say a quick few words about who we are. So the CTD um, exists to help provide training and professional development opportunities for district staff in Washington, um, as well as to help kind of facilitate sharing and networking um, with our district staff and partners. So a big thank you to Karen for um, reaching out to the CTD with this uh, webinar and, and other programming that we've had. And just a plug that if you have training ideas or projects, programs, anything you wanna share out, please do reach out to the CTD. Um, we'd love to hear from you and help coordinate um, a webinar like this one. Couple of quick logistics we are recording today and the um, video link as well as some of the additional materials and links that you'll hear referenced today will be posted on the CTD website uh, in our training library section. And then I think just one logistic thing, make, uh, we are in a meeting format today, so everyone's got control of their own mute and unmute. So please do help us keep the interference down today by making sure you're muted um, unless you're in, intending to be unmuted and asking your questions. So I think that's all I have um, from me. And thank you again for being here. And I'm going to turn it over to Karen, who's going to kick us off. Thanks, Jan. And thanks, everybody, for joining this morning. I'm Karen Hills with the Washington State Conservation Commission, and I'm happy to share with you this morning uh, work that's been underway this biennium. Um, I'm going to give a brief overview of this effort, and then we'll have presentations uh, from Georgine Yorgi from Washington State University and Colton Meyer from KR Creative Strategies on uh, the work that they've done to support this effort. Um, we're gonna hold our questions and answer, answers for the presenters until the end. You're welcome to drop them in the chat if you'd like, um, but we will hold those to the end. I'm just gonna give a little um, overview of the proviso language that's guiding this work. Um, so this was uh, $200,000 from the Climate Commitment Act funds that came to the commission during the 2023 legislative session. Um, this is the language that uh, is guiding our work Essentially, this bolded italicized part is, is um, one big piece of it, uh, which is to conduct an evaluation of the current contribution that organic and climate smart agriculture makes towards Washington's climate response goals, what potential there is for increasing this contribution, and how additional investments will help realize this potential while supporting resiliency. And the proviso language um, also inst instructs the commission to include departments of ag and ecology and other relevant state agencies, uh, WSU, conservation districts, tribal governments, non-governmental organizations, and other relevant stakeholders. Uh, originally, the deadline for this report was May 1st, 2024. Um, thankfully, we asked for and received a deadline extension um, during the 2024 session to um, make that deadline May 1st, 2025. Um, so we are accomplishing this work um, by working with uh, Washington State University um, and KR Creative Strategies. So WSU is leading the effort to write a report um, to really connect the dots between the solutions that are available in agriculture and Washington's climate response goals um, to tighten that connection and provide some important context. Um, and really the focus of the WSU work is on you know, the mitigation piece of uh, Washington's climate response goals. And then meanwhile, there's an, also an engagement piece that's underway. Um, the commission uh, reached out to Washington tribes as well as conservation districts to invite them to participate in interviews um, and also uh, provided a list of kind of representatives from those other entities listed in the, the uh, proviso for some targeted interviews that took place um, over the summer. Um, so we worked with KR Creative Strategies uh, to conduct the interviews and summarize them 
and you'll hear more about that later from Colton Meyer from KR. So uh, we're really now in phase two of our engagement, which is this webinar. Um, we'll be providing a link to a survey that uh, anyone attending the webinar or watching the recording later can provide feedback on this effort through. Um, we'll be asking for that feedback by uh, November 15th so that it can be considered for inclusion in the final report. Um, so we are really excited this morning to share with you where things stand on this work in progress. Um, and I'm gonna introduce Georgine Yorgi from Washington State University, who's gonna give uh, the first presentation. She is the director of Washington State University's energy program and is a senior research fellow with the Center for Sustaining Agriculture and Natural Resources. <clears throat> Over the last 15 years at WSU, Georgine has worked on numerous research and extension projects at the nexus of food, energy, water, and climate. Thanks, Georgine. And thanks, Karen. Um, let me make sure that people can hear me fine, although I can no longer see the chat. Just so I guess just break in, Karen, if people are having trouble hearing me. I know there was that problem. And why? Oh, there we go. All right, so I'm gonna talk about the mitigation potential of climate smart and organic agriculture in Washington. Um, I guess I will start at the outset by saying, given the proviso language, boy, it would be nice if I could tell you, here's the number, here's how much um, climate smart and organic agriculture has contributed to climate change mitigation already. And here's that potential if we were able to provide you know, certain support. I'm not going to do that today I, because it's not possible. Um, and so what I am going to do and really hoping to share with you over the next 20 minutes is a sense of why this is a complicated question. Um, where are we currently um, in terms of answering this question and what's some work underway that's going to get us closer to, to an answer over the next several years and beyond? We'll say that this is a group presentation. So really not just my presentation, but the work of a lot of other folks at WSU who've been helping um, think about these issues, put together the presentation, and will help with the report as well. The first part, so this presentation is in three parts, and I'll try and end each part with some key points to keep us on track. This first part is really just asking the question, where do Washington's agricultural emissions come from? And what does that tell us or not tell us about how agriculture can contribute to climate mitigation? I think perhaps a logical place to start is with the Washington State's greenhouse gas inventory showing Washington emissions by sector. So you can see if you look at that pie chart, agriculture is a fairly small piece of the pie, 6% of Washington's emissions. And that might lead you to say, boy, so does that mean agriculture doesn't have such a big role to play in terms of mitigating climate emissions? I guess I will say that no, I think the answer is that agriculture actually can play a bigger role in, in terms of, of mitigating climate change than you might think from that number. If we think broad, so actually, sorry, let me go back. So those emissions are made up of nitrous oxide from agricultural soils and methane from manure management and enteric fermentation. And this is kind of a part, it's a piece of the picture. There's, there's some some pieces missing from this picture. So for example, you know, fuel use for transporting agricultural products or for, um, for moving things around, that's in the transportation sector, um, other energy use and carbon sequestration in, in agricultural soils is also not showing because this is just showing the emissions side of things. So if we think broadly about everything it takes to produce food for, for us as a society, food actually represents a bigger piece of, of emissions. So these are global data, not Washington state data, but just to give you that sense of, if we're thinking about that, all the set of activities that are required to produce food, all the inputs that go into producing that food, and then all the activities after the farm that get food to, you know, to people for consumption, we're talking about 26% of global emissions. So much more substantial piece. 
I want to come back to that carbon sequestration piece and just show you why I think the fact that that's missing is, you know, is kind of important here. So these again are global data, but I just like the way this graph shows. Okay, if you look at the top here, yellow line, you're looking at business as usual. So this is greenhouse gas emissions year over year without any um, any uh, activities towards mitigation. Then if you look at that green area under the curve, that's the piece that, that can be reduced by you know, taking what technologies we have currently that emit greenhouse gases and replacing them with cleaner technologies. So conventional abatement technologies is what they're calling it. That. that gets us to that line between the green and the brown, but doesn't get us to net zero greenhouse gas emissions. There's still that area under the curve that's brown. Those are emissions that are either technologically not feasible to, to eliminate or super expensive to eliminate. From an agricultural perspective, you could think at least given current technologies and technologies kind of in the near term, nitrous oxide emissions from soils might be part of that brown, right? Nitrous oxide emissions occur from naturally occurring bacteria in the soil, and it's hard to grow crops without any nitrogen, even though we can do you know, a good job managing that nitrogen and using it as efficiently as we can. So that's just an example of what might be made up of that that piece of emissions that's hard to just eliminate. What gets us to net zero then is this blue area below zero that's drawing carbon out of the atmosphere and then storing it. That's everything from you know pretty high tech carbon removal technologies, biochar, more, and other strategies that would fall under sort of natural climate solutions. And so many of those natural climate solutions are relevant to agriculture as well. So what types of practices are we talking about when we're talking about agriculture contributing to mitigating climate change? And just this is not a comprehensive list, it's not intended to be, but just to give you a sense of what kinds of things we're talking about. We're talking about reducing or eliminating tillage, eliminating residue burning, increasing cropping intensity or diversity, energy efficiency or renewable energy strategies, agroforestry, enhancing nitrogen use efficiency, reducing lagoon storage of liquid manures or capturing methane for energy, feed additives, soil amendments. Um, in, one thing I hope you notice when I read through this list is that we're talking about many of these practices are things that we've been talking about for a long time um, for other reasons, meaning there are strategies that provide other co-benefits to agricultural systems in terms of farm economics, in term, terms of environmental sustainability, in terms of maintaining clean air and clean water. Other thing I want to say at the outset is that when we're talking about climate change mitigation within agriculture, it's really important to, even if we're focused on Washington State, it's really important to think about this in a global context. Because if we attempt to reduce emissions in a way that pushes agricultural entities to other parts of the U.S. or other parts of the world, we may not have reduced emissions overall, right? What matters is global emissions. And we might have even made things worse. We might have increased emissions in the process. Um, agriculture in Washington state is very efficient um, and productive. That's both organic agriculture and conventional agriculture. And um, when we think in terms of environmental standards, when we think in terms of worker protections or um, wages paid on all of these metrics, Washington has some of the highest standards in the world. So if we're pushing agricultural production elsewhere, it might be associated elsewhere with greater emissions. And just to kind of bring that to a more local level or, or statewide level, this map is showing agricultural land conversion from 2001 to 2016. Um, conversion to both urban high density and low density residential uses. And just, you know, if agriculture is not present in our state, then it certainly is not contributing to climate change mitigation in our state. So key messages from this part, 
you know, emissions from food systems are a substantial component of global greenhouse gas emissions. Not all of those emissions are under control of agricultural operations. Second, from an agricultural perspective, we need to be thinking about impacts to three, three categories, nitrous oxide, methane, and then carbon sequestration, as well as energy use. And then last, for mitigation to be effective, we need to be thinking about mitigating emissions while supporting agricultural viability in the state. The second part digs into the data a little bit, I'll tell you just a little, um, to ask how much evidence do we have in the Pacific Northwest about the impacts of particular management practices on climate mitigation and what work is underway in our state to continue to develop a better answer to this question. For those who really wanna dig into the data, I will point to this extension publication that we finished last year called Carbon Sequestration Potential in Cropland Soils in the Inland Pacific Northwest, Knowledge and Gaps. It's not gonna cover all of agriculture, but it does dig into the data that we have in our region, um, sort of system by system for cropland soils. I'll give you a taste of the data from that publication um, here. And we're looking here at regional data that are related to eliminating tillage in dryland areas of the Pacific Northwest. Sorry for that title being off. This look first at the map in the lower right hand part of the slide. And just to orient you, we're looking at much of the eastern part of Washington, that western Idaho, sort of northwestern Idaho where dryland grains are grown, and then um, northern, sort of central to eastern Oregon. One challenge when we're thinking about, okay, we're going to implement this practice and we want to estimate if we did that, how much carbon would be stored in soils. One challenge with that is that there these are biological systems. And the answer to that question is, it depends. It depends on environmental factors. You know, How much rainfall do you have? It depends on what types of soils we're talking about. It depends on what were your initial soil carbon levels. Um, depends on what soil depth were we talking about. One way to kind of cope with that complexity is to divide up the dryland area into different bands where environmental conditions are relatively more similar. So if you look at that map, that brown band is the winter wheat fallow region where we're growing just one crop every two years because of limits to, to rainfall. The yellow part is the transitional zone where we're growing mostly a crop roughly two out of every three years. And the blue area is the annual cropping area where we're growing a crop every year. You look at the table then, that table is color-coded the same way, brown, yellow, blue. And you can see if you look at that third column over the number of studies that we have in our region that have long-term data sets looking at what's the impact from eliminating tillage. And you can see that the time period covered is not, um, uh, not unreasonable either. We're not talking about one to two year studies. And that's important because what we care about when we're talking about carbon storage in agricultural soils is long-term changes in, in soil carbon levels. And the authors, this Brown and Huggins from 2012, calculated here's the change, here's the change in, in soil profile carbon with you know a mean and a confidence interval. They what they say, though, is that the underlying variability is quite high in those data. And so they actually say, OK, rather than thinking about the mean and a confidence interval, really, maybe we should be thinking about this in, different, in a different way. And one possible way to think about that is to think about a cumulative probability estimate, meaning we have a curve and we're, you know, you, you pick what percentage you want. We're 50% likely we're storing this much carbon in those soils. So that's kind of a taste of where we're at. Look, if we're, what we're doing is kind of taking a literature review approach and saying, okay, what, what science has been done and what data sets do we have on this? I want to make the point that a, these data are limited in certain ways. So for example, we're looking here at data that don't talk about didn't look at what's going on in the deeper part of the soil profile in terms of soil carbon. That's something that, that scientists are looking at now. 
I'm also going to tell you that this is about as good as it gets in terms of number of studies, time period covered by the data. And, you know, this, this particular practice change is one that has been studied for a long time. So we have more data and these particular cropping systems also. So, you know, if, if we're talking about a change in practices that say in raspberry production systems, or that's in organic apple production systems, or that's in, you know, West side, small diversified farms, the data available to us suddenly start to look a lot more thin. Um, there are people who have looked at these questions from more of a global scale, and there certainly are more data if you look globally, but you got to be a little bit careful when you do that to think about, okay, is the environment, are the environment and the soils close enough to ours to, to really be drawing relevant lessons? And are the production systems similar enough to what's going on here to be relevant to our agricultural systems? So I'll mention that there it was there is a big effort in the European Union, sort of an analysis of meta-analyses around individual agricultural practices that came out in um, this past year. Um, but again, you need to look at those with a little bit of caution about what is applicable to our systems. Um, so if you if you don't want to look from a literature review perspective. The other way to think about this is from more of a modeling perspective. Those models are informed by the experimental data that we have, um, but allow you to look in a, a spatial, spatially explicit way across the landscape and to think about scenarios running forward. That is also work that's kind of underway in our region. Um, but it's not a, it's not an easy effort. So I'll just give you a taste of some work that's ongoing at WSU. This is work that's, um, of Amin Naruzi, who's a PhD candidate in biological systems engineering in Kirti Rajagapalan's lab. So to progress further with those models, we need field scale, spatiotemporally explicit information about management practices. And that we don't have yet. It's, that's a really key input to models that could quantify what's the carbon accrual potential of these systems? What are the other greenhouse gas emissions impacts, whether they're you know, positive or negative? And what are the co-benefits that would be provided by these practices in terms of soil health or a reduction in erosion potential? And so what Amin did is it's working to develop a model that allows us to have the spatiotemporally explicit data set. He did drive-by surveys and collected data on residue across the state, um, and or sorry, the dry, the dryland regions. And this is super important because residue is really different if you're talking about, say, a wheat field compared to the P part of the rotation or another part of the rotation. He's then developing a model using um, satellite-based imagery data, other environmental va variables, and these ground truth data to develop a model that lets him predict what the um, tillage practices are. And then on the right here, you can see the resulting map, which is kind of the first map of tillage practices in this spatiotemporally explicit way. Um, he's on, in the process of comparing those data to, um, sorry, to ground truth those data working with conservation districts across the state. So once that's done, I, I do wanna sort of give people a sense of this is a long-term effort. So those data sets then would need to be integrated with models that can quantify ecosystem services and carbon benefits. That is not a small effort. Um, and then, you know, this is only work on tillage practices. So we would need to be able to create products for other relevant management practices, such as cover cropping or rotations. And then last but not least, just want to come back to the point that, okay, we're talking about one single change, a change in, in, um, in tillage but there are lots of impacts that that causes throughout that production system. You are driving across the field a different number of times. You're dealing with different disease pressures, sort of your, you know, 
you're changing one thing in a very complex system. So you have impacts not just on carbon sequestration, but on other emissions as well. So these data are model data, but showing you the same three systems, annual cropping, transitional, and the grain fallow region. You can see there's a change in, in carbon sequestration, but also in um, these other aspects of greenhouse gas emissions. So key messages from that part, you know, farming systems are complex managed ecosystems and carbon storage and other impacts are variable because of the nature of biological systems. This is not a cement factory. Um, a single change can have impacts on multiple greenhouse gases, including both direct and indirect emissions, and those can be upstream and downstream of the farm. And then understanding the impacts of particular agricultural management practices on carbon sequestration and greenhouse gas emissions is still an active area of scientific scientific inquiry on multiple fronts. You know, some of those I mentioned today, some of those I didn't get to. So really our understanding will continue to evolve. Um, and then just be a little bit cautious about relying on data from other locations. Are soils, climate, production practices, other features relevant to our situation? I should mention one other ongoing effort that I'm aware of that may, again, help provide us better insight over the next several years. And this is a, one of, um, sorry, NRCS invested in climate smart commodity projects across the US. One of those is led out of Colorado State, but includes partners in Washington through the Washington State Department of Agriculture. And there's an effort there to really, again, perform a lit review that's broader than just data from our region, but, but kind of bringing to bear or drawing in um, production system experts to really evaluate which other data are relevant to our systems. Last, last part, much shorter, how do we think about developing the next generation of climate friendly practices um, when we're thinking about what's that potential likely to be going into the future? You know, I wanna start by just um, with, a, with the fact that Think about how much farms have changed over the last 100 years, how dramatically they have innovated in response to changing economic incentives. Even the last 20 years, you know, agriculture looked very different in our state 20 years ago than it does today. So, you know, that sort of would, would lead you to just... Um, not think we have all the answers today, right? The people are gonna continue to creatively develop new practices and, and new ability to grow food while reducing the climate impact. Um, two points I wanna make about kind of organics role in, in that innovative, innovative capacity or, or driving some of that innovation. You know, organic really demonstrates agriculture's um, innovative capacity and its ability to change in response to financial incentives. We've seen enormous growth in organic systems over the last 30 years, for example. And then organic agriculture has really both reclaimed some older practices, um, modified them to fit within in modern production systems, and then developed entirely new production methods, um, many of which reduce the use of inputs that are more greenhouse gas intense. And that you know, those practices then are not confined to organic. Many of those practices are used also in um, conventional systems as well. So really serving as kind of this engine of innovation and a full system from, you know, science and scientists asking questions that are prompted by their needs to, you know, input suppliers to the far the production practices themselves toward to the markets needed to support organic. We shouldn't necessarily be entirely sanguine, you know, entirely um, think like, okay, this this innovation engine is just automatically going to occur. So if we look here, these are data on total farms and organic acreage in Washington over the last 30 years. You can see the steady growth, but we do see over the last several years kind of this um, leveling off in terms of acres and a drop in the total number of farms, as well as a reduction, it's not shown here, but a reduction in the number of transitional acres. 
So trying to draw all of that back together toward to the question, you know, that that we were asked at the outset. Yes, there is clearly opportunity to address climate change and provide co-benefits to farms and the environment in Washington. Um, don't underestimate the adaptive capacity of agriculture to respond to market signals and develop new practices. So we're talking sometimes about supporting adoption of existing practices, as well as kind of looking for innovation into the future. Keeping in mind though, that that innovation does take time and it needs to fit within a particular agricultural system and, and the economics that go with that system. So just bringing that back again to this global perspective, you know, farming has thin margins and high competitive pressure. Not all markets are national and global, but a lot of them are influenced by what's going on at the national and global level. So what that means is, you know, any efforts to support mitigation in Washington really has to make sense within that broader economy. And that's it. Happy to take questions at the end. Thanks, Georgine. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Colton Meyer. Uh, Colton is the communications director at KR Creative Strategies. He grew up on a century farm in Iowa and has been working in agriculture and outreach for over 20 years. And before I hand it over to Colton, I'm just going to say I'm going to be dropping the link to the report um, that KR Creative uh, produced into the chat, and it will also be available um, with the recording of this webinar. Thanks, Colton. Thank you, Karen. Can you see my slides okay? Awesome. Well, thank you very much for that nice introduction. Again, my name is Colton Meyer, and I'm the Communications Director for KR Creative Strategies. And um, thank you to Karen and the Commission for including us in this effort. It was, it was a lot of fun working on this. So I'm going to be talking about the climate smart agriculture interviews that we conducted over the summer. And to give you just a brief, a brief background on, on KR Creative Strategies, we're a company based out of Medical Lake, Washington, that specializes in helping agriculture and conservation organizations with their communication needs, strategic marketing, video, uh, and graphic design. Some of our customers include Washington Wheat Foundation, the Washington Potato Commission, State Conservation Commission, the Department of Agriculture in Washington, and several conservation districts throughout Washington and the country. So after the commission received the proviso, they approached our company, KR Creative Strategies, about conducting the interviews. The objective was to learn firsthand what's working in Washington, what's not, and what can be approved upon to help Washington meet their climate smart goals. So referring to the picture here in this slide, um, just as the pasture stick is a tool to assess pasture forage conditions, the interviews are a tool to assess climate smart egg activities in Washington in both organic and conventional systems. So our approach, so the interviewee contact list was provided by the commission. Um, KRCS reached out to 45 different entities and scheduled interviews with those who responded. Questions were developed by the Conservation Commission, Washington State University and KRCS. Uh, KRCS conducted majority of the interviews by phone. However, we did um, have two interviews or two interviewees who submitted their responses via email. So we had 29 total interviews conducted out of the 44 or 45 entities that we reached out to. 16 of those were to production ag and 13 of those were to non-production ag folks. So, here is the full list. Um, on the left there are the production side. On the right is the non-production folks. Um, so due to time limitations, I can't hover over this slide too long, but I, I encourage you all to refer to the final report to go through this uh, in more depth. And then in the final report, we also show the full list of entities that we reached out to. 
So we did have some general questions just for both production and non-production. Um, and those were, what is your role? What's the geographic location that you work in and the type of production you're involved with? Are you organic, conventional, or both? And then we would go through four specific questions for production and non-production. And then, and I'll get to those here in the next slides, but then we would close with, do you have any additional comments? And would you like to receive um, an invite to, to this webinar we're taking part in now and a copy of the final report? So for the production ag interview questions, those were, um, what are the most common conservation practices used in your industry? What uh, barriers prevent scaling up? What are existing resources? What existing resources um, are used most to support adoption? And then additional tools and resources, what additional tools and resources are needed to scale up any effort in the climate smart space? And then uh, we asked if there was any difference between organic and conventional systems for these questions. So for example, if we're asking ad what additional tools and resources are needed, are those tools different if they're involved with organic or conventional? On the non-production ag interview questions, we asked um, what resources inside your organization support climate smart ag? Um, resources outside of your organization that support climate smart ag, what additional resources are needed to scale up, and then what additional questions should we be asking? So an example of that would, one of the responses that we had was, uh, what are strategies to bridge the urban rural divide? Urban folks need to understand how rural folks feed them. Uh, there seems to be a lack of respect understanding and general awareness of growers and producers. So that's an example of another question that we could be asking to um, make progress in this climate smart effort. So this is just a simple chart, just kind of showing how we, uh, how we organized um, this, this presentation and how we organized the final report. So all the responses were entered into spreadsheets. Each response received a tally for every identical or similar answer. And then the responses with the most tallies were organized into four different themes. Um, and again, please refer to the final report. And I think Karen's gonna be sharing that in the chat if she hasn't already. Um, so re refer to that report for, for more specifics and more details. So our first theme is funding risk mitigation and expert assistance. Agriculture needs flexible grantee driven funding and assistance to navigate change. So one of the things that we universally heard from everyone that we interviewed was just the cost. Um, it's one of the largest barriers to adopting climate smart practices. You know, cost share sources are abundant, but what we heard was it's very, they can be very limiting due to not enough funding, we heard a lot of great things about conservation districts and their, their great work that they do planning, but the implementation dollars just aren't there. Um, one individual mentioned that he went to the district for planning, but then he went to federal programs like EQIP or RCPP to actually get the money to implement the practices they were interested in. Um, you know, poor flexibility, an example of that is and RCS's um, adjusted gross income or AGI requirements, you know, many people perceive that as, as unfair. Like Georgine was referencing, you know, margins are thin in agriculture. So on paper, it might look like they made a lot of profit, but when you actually look at, um, after you deduct all those input, high input costs, oftentimes there's not much money left over. And a lot of those people, they want to do some great things, but they just, they don't qualify for it. And then the complexity of the, of the programs and, and rules and eligibility requirements. We heard from a number of people that just, they don't have time to jump through the hoops. Um, and specific to organic producers, you know, funding is available to make that transition from conventional to organic. But after those first couple of years and that transition is complete, um, 
there's just not much resources left after that. So a lot of these veteran organic farmers just kind of feel uh, left out in the cold. So we've got changing weather, agriculture is always changing, programs are changing. Um, and we heard just how important it is to have flexible programs and adequate CTA or, or conservation technical assistance to help producers navigate these changes. CTA overall was really highly regarded by everybody interviewed. It's just a capacity problem where we there's just not enough boots on the ground. And a lot of the traditional producers still prefer someone to come out to the farm and ranch and talk one on one. And you need to have the capacity to do that um, from from what we heard. Sometimes being on the Internet, social media, it's just not good enough. So to share some quotes we heard, farmers Farmers could use their own HR department to better know and understand all the rules and regulations they need to follow. And cost, federal program rankings and rules can be complicated and time consuming, and a huge gap exists in technical assistance in facilitating signups. So our second theme, research and data, and this ties in really well to what Georgine just talked about. Agriculture needs baseline data and proven on-farm results. Um, I don't, I can't think of a single person that didn't reference the need for more research. You know, the potato, the potatoes want soil health research, cattle producers want more feedlot options and, and research that goes into manure. Um, organic wants, you know, organic is very innovative, but they want to be even more in, innovative um, and research to just unlock more tools and options for them. The, in, the organic individuals that we interviewed said that they just feel like conventional has so many more options and organic can just feel kind of boxed in and limited. So they really want to lead the way in, in being more innovative. And that takes research. And they want research that is location specific, directly applicable to, to the geographic region they live in. And they want it to be long-term uh, continuous research so they can see how how it impacts the environment and their bottom line over the duration. And all of this helps producers understand um, practice adoption impacts upfront before investing. Um, you know, data helps drive decisions based on proven results and return on investment. Improving data transfer across various interfaces and platforms would allow greater accessibility and value added programs like carbon markets. One producer specifically mentioned that artificial intelligence or AI could help make that sharing more seamless. So to share a quote on that, need to quantify benefits of practice change over longer periods. Moving on to the third theme, recognition for agricultural contributions and value. Climate smart policies in Washington should, should support agriculture, not target it. Um, we universally heard that there needs to be more public awareness on eggs, economic contribution and connecting people to their food source. You know, there's, there's a perception of, of a divide out there and we, and we did hear that, but there was also um, resonating language about people in production, wanting urban people or anybody to come visit their farm, learn about the, the time involved, the work involved, the logistics, and just see what goes into food production. There have been instances of, of blaming the farmer and at the same time asking farmers to put in more time, money, and labor to solve the climate crisis. And many indiv individuals that we interviewed perceive this as unfair. In some cases, regulation has led to unviable operations. Um, again, what Georgine referenced, Washington, there's room for improvement, but what we heard was that Washington's doing a great job and, um, and we need to keep those operations viable so that they don't leave and go to other locations. Government distrust, mental health issues, um, and a lot of that comes from agriculture just simply being vilified instead of valued. So, and this is where, again, going back to CTA, conservation technical assistance, it can play a huge role 
and sharing the on-farm outcomes and successes to improve public opinion. So to have farmers be more open to share their story, to reduce misinformation, government needs to stop unfairly targeting them because the farmer fears retaliation. They just want to grow food and sell it, not necessarily be on social media or get involved with policy. So our, our fourth and final theme is an inclusive approach for collaborative process. Build approaches to climate smart agriculture from the farm up. Programs can be more aligned to funding cycles and legislative sessions than to the seasonality of farm work from based on what we heard from interviewees. Um, language use can be disrespectful and un unfamiliar. So for example, when we first started these interviews and we would, we would kick off the phone call, you know, not everyone knew exactly what we were referring to when we talked about climate smart agriculture, but once we showed them a list of examples and started referring to them as conservation practices, then, um, then they knew exactly what we were referring to. You know, farmers have been involved in decision-making in the past and that's great. And that needs to continue and scale up so that everything is, is more accessible down the road. You know, when programs, when program rules and timelines tie in well to farm operations, you end up with greater accessibility and greater accessibility leads to more engagement. And then the need to have inclusive feedback on farms of all scales. Um, take riparian buffers, for example. We heard about that quite a bit. Um, and they affect everybody, but we heard the strongest outcries from smaller operations and organic farms that tend to be a little smaller in size. When you take, when you're taking farm out of production for these larger riparian buffers, um, just Percentage wise, it takes a, a larger amount of their farm out of production, potentially making that farm unviable. So disconnect between capital policies and what's practical in real life. So just thank you to all for listening. Uh, and thank you to all interview participants who are attending this morning. And just one final note, you know, there's room for improvement and capacity needs to grow across the board based on what we heard. Um, but Washington has so much to be proud of and has a great deal of effort and has put a great deal of effort into making progress towards their climate, climate smart goals. And a lot of people want to be a part of that solution. And the fact that we had so much engagement in these interviews um, by producers and others involved in production ag is, is really encouraging. Um, so I encourage you all to read the final report for more information and thank you for your time. Thanks Colton. And just another reminder, if there was something um, that you want to provide feedback on that you didn't hear mentioned in today's presentations, please fill out the survey uh, by November 15th. Also, if you're interested in getting a copy of the final report from the commission, I will be sharing it through the Sustainable Farms and Fields uh, listserv that you can subscribe to. Um, I'll drop that in the chat here in just a minute or you can also request a copy um, via that survey. Uh, so I'd like to open it up for questions now. Um, so you could either drop your question in the chat, raise your hand. Uh, looks like we see, I have a question from uh, Bikram. There seems to be a decline in organic agriculture based on the first presenter's final slide. Could you share other indicators that may be affecting this decline? I'm actually going to pass that question off to Mike Brady um, on our team. I noticed his screen name is Kirti Roger Pellin, which is another colleague who worked on the presentation, but Mike. Yeah, I think Kirti's on this presentation about four times. So we'll thank Kirti for all of her contributions. But yeah, sorry, my name is Mike Brady. I'm an economist at WSU. Uh, yeah, the, so if you look back a little further on that graph, you'll see when we tend to have economic downturns, um, Either recessions and or especially um, price inflation usually leads into organic. Um, and that's, uh, you know, 20, you don't have to tell anybody about about inflation anymore. Um, before, prior to 2020, it had been quite a while since we'd had that. So, you know, food prices went up a lot in that probably curtailed organic a bit. Food price inflation is down a bit. So we'll see where this goes. If you go back to 2008, you know, the Great Recession, 
you saw a similar flattening of organic. And so it definitely, you know, doesn't, doesn't say, oh, we're, we're on a flat trajectory from here on out. It's, it's, we're really just now coming out of those, that kind of higher price period of people adjusting. Um, uh, although eggs are still expensive. Um, so that, that's, uh, kind of flattened things out, but it definitely shouldn't be interpreted as a, oh, organic is just flat from here on out. But the, the, COVID, price inflation, and food, and how that affected budgets, certainly you could um, see an effect there. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Bob? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm a, I am live in the west, we're west of the, we're actually in the Puget Sound area, and um, I, uh, I have a tenant farmer on site, and she, uh, uh, she, she, she's uh, uh, certified naturally grown, so she's screening towards organic. Um, I, I, we used, we used to, uh, my wife and I used to raise the vegetables, but we're retired. Give us a break. And so what I did was I put in a a composting operation, and my sole source of feed is a horse stable that has manure with with uh, sawdust bedding, and it's perfect thirty to one carbon nitrogen ratio. So um, I can produce, I can process most of what he had, what he produces into a hot composted with passive aeration. It's really good stuff. And, but his, when, when he's really rocking and rolling, he's got a high population over there. I can't take it all. So I, but this is a retired dairy farm and we have lots of fallow uh, pasture land from years ago. And so, so that extra just goes out on the, out on the sod. And I take my tractor out there and smear it around and let the sod grow back up through it. So I, I, what are the considerations about about uh, uh, manure, composted or direct applied? I was uh, I took a course in composting from the Washington Organic Recycling Council, and uh, the, the pamphlet said that, that, that it's more valuable for the soil to put the manure directly on the soil because then you don't lose so much of the carbon to the, to the composting process. But, but what are the considerations in, in, in your world around sequestering carbon in that regard? Thank you. Yeah, that's fine. I can, I can take that one. Um, so yeah, thanks for the, the comments and question, Bob. Um, certainly um, using manure in, um, for growing crops is, and, and forage is an important piece of this, uh, this puzzle and is one of the uh, climate smart practices um, that is, you know, considered in this. So I am probably don't have time to get into a lot of specifics, so I might keep moving on the question, but thank you so much for the question. Um, so it looks like Donnie Wilcox says the proviso requests a report with findings and recommendations. This seems like there's a lot of findings as the next step to develop specific recommendations. I see solutions near the end of the report document, but they are not really specific recommendations. So yeah, thanks for that. Um, I'll clarify. So the report document that I shared is um, the interview reports from KR Creative. Those are gonna be folded into this final report that's due th to the legislature uh, May, 2025. So we will be working on um, kind of building out, you know, what the proviso asks for in terms of, um, you know, I guess more of a path forward with what we do with uh, what's been learned through WSU's work and the um, the interview. So yes, there will be more of that type of uh, work in the final report. Um, Kat says, how do you anticipate the STAR program to be for data gathering and sharing? Um, I would defer, I don't know if-, if uh, Amy's here. Dan okay. I was going to say one thing about that is just that my understanding of the STAR program is that it's more data sort of um, review of existing data. And one thing I didn't mention that I probably should have, but it's another really important ongoing effort in the state, is through the Soil Health Initiative, which was established several years ago um, and is a collaboration between WSU, the Conservation Commission, and the Department of Agriculture, they're also now, um, I'm going to get the number wrong, but it's like four or five new long-term um, soil health experiments in the region. And those are going to generate new data that's really relevant to these questions. So they're, they're, that's another piece of kind of ongoing work that should contribute. But Amy, maybe you want to comment about the STAR program specifically. Um, hey, this is 
Danny, I, Amy helps with the SAR program, but uh, I have a staff person, Lauren, who manages it. We've actually done a really comprehensive literature review on different practices and their impacts on things like greenhouse gas emissions, but also things like soil moisture and erosion prevention, aggregate stability. So in the case of something like grains and legumes, we had hundreds of papers to review, and that was great. In the case of tree fruit, I think we had like 11 papers to review. So there are a lot of data available to us. It just varies widely from one system to the next. So um, happy to share any, any of that if people are interested. Thanks, Danny. Um, I'm going to move on to the next question, which is from Terry Williams, uh, working with Oregon State University and Colville Tribes on climate smart commodities. We are currently using a modeling tool to determine payments for farmers on a variety of practices, but it sounds like the data isn't there to really do this question mark. Um, so I am not real familiar with that effort. There are certainly a lot of modeling tools um, out there that can be used to um, look, you know, to estimate impacts of different practices. Um, I think, and Georgine, you can you can uh, speak to this as well, but I think um, maybe what Georgine was more referring to was, um, you know, just that we can't really get to uh, a, a real satisfying overall estimate of uh, mitigation potential because of the um, the variability across cropping systems and practices. And so there are certainly models and those models are used um, to come up with estimates, but um, you know, there's still a lot of work that could be done to increase our confidence in in those estimates. And I don't know if you want to add to that, Georgine. I'll just say that we had a postdoctoral scholar who was sort of digging into this question in the last several years. Specifically, that project was around looking at um, compost addition to agricultural soils. And she was comparing um, long-term data sets that exist in our region to both um, Comet Farm and Descent. Um, and in some cases could get quite good agreement between the experimental data and the modeling data. In other cases, not good agreement. <laughs> um, some of that is probably relatively easily fixed. And, and you know, folks are working on the modeling side, folks are working to improve those models. We do see that there's kind of a trade-off between user friendliness and sophistication. And sometimes that also is part of what's going on there too. So I guess I'd say it's kind of a like building the airplane while you fly it kind of situation. Thanks, Georgine. It looks like there's a question from Bikram uh, about the second presenter touched on popular technology terms such as AI and automation. Just as we noticed how economic downturns impact agricultural practices, how is the ag sector embracing uh, the impact of fast evolving technology sector? In particular, how would you like to best leverage uh, agricultural automation and AI for advancing organic farming practices? Asking this question as a former ag automation student from WSU, CPAS, go kooks. Yeah, I don't know <laughs> if anyone wants to take that. Um, I, I can take a bit of it. So uh, I would just point to uh, the Ag Aid project, which is a uh, it's uh, uh, an institute, a $20 million grant. It's uh, headquartered out at w WSU um, on artificial intelligence for agriculture. Um, and there's a lot of information on the web page uh, on uh, both water management, um, labor, so a lot of work in tree fruit, other farm operations, um, automated uh, tools for sort of taking and forecasting, um, and then uh, automating some decisions, say like frost protection, that. So there's a, a whole raft of, of technologies um, being looked at. Uh, it, part of that project, because it is ongoing, um, you know, the in terms of the economics of it, it is certainly the case that, you know, the Apple industry is having a bit of a hard time right now. 
does that affect you know they're looking uh, they're looking to making um, willingness to make capital investments um sure it certainly affects their ability to to do that um but you know these are long-term technology developments but the kind of the economic cycles by commodities um certainly you know um affect those decisions okay thanks mike um, we have, I know it's 10 o'clock, uh, so people might need to drop and that's fine. Um, I think our presenters are able to stay a little longer. If we have more questions come in. Um, I see a question from Louise. Margaret, have these projects or uh, the CSC project looked at existing Russell data on management impacts to soil organic carbon? Um, in any thoughts to share on the usefulness for the data in that program. It seems like the data is more limited in Washington and Russell. I know the data is decades old at this point, but I believe the original data in there was developed over five to 10 years on a farm monitoring across the county. Curious if there are thoughts from this group on if Russell is still relevant. So this is the revised, I think it's revised universal soil loss equation, which is a, a model um, used by kind of in the conservation world around um, soil erosion. So um, uh, my understanding of that is that that's not really looking at so much at the, um, the loss of organic carbon through, um, you know, natural processes le leading to greenhouse gas emissions and sort of that flux um, with, uh, and, and that's more looking at actual water erosion from soil. So important, but uh, maybe not the whole picture. Does anyone have anything else to add to Russell? Uh, oh, it gives values on soil carbon stocks and soil condition index. Okay. I think it's, it's still relevant. I think maybe it's just kind of a different way of looking at uh, what's happening in the soil. Um, there's lots of different models that measure lots of different things. So I'm, I might have to follow up with you, Louise, on that question um, at a later date. And if anyone else has any thing to add, feel free. Okay. Looks like people are dropping, so maybe that's the end of our questions. If anybody else has any late breaking questions, feel free to raise your hand or drop them in the chat. Um, otherwise, we'll thank our presenters today and, um, and our attendees. And we'll, again, encourage you to fill out that uh, survey form to provide feedback. And um, again, the, the recording of this webinar will be sent to all the registrants.